Well, good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. My name is Peter Lowen. I'm the director of the school, and it's my real honor to welcome you here tonight for the celebration of the Gelber Prize, uh, of our most recent winner of the Gelber Prize, of our chair of the uh, Gelber Prize jury. I'm going to get out of the way pretty quickly, but I want to do two things first. The, the first one is just to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. It has been for thousands of years the traditional land of the Huron, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit. And I uh, personally feel very thankful uh, that we're able to work and to play and to live uh, on this part of, uh, of Turtle Island. Um, the second thing I wanted to do was I wanted to just note a couple things that are, that are special about tonight. The first is that you might notice that you're not staring at a screen where everyone is uh, encapsulated in a small tile, but instead we're actually all together. Everyone here has legs, uh, people have different heights, uh, and you're not going to have to raise your hand or take yourself off mute to be heard. So that is uh, relatively novel these days, and let's hope we can keep it up. Um, it's especially important for us because though we've had the Gelber Prize at the Monk School for uh, many years, we've not been able to celebrate it in person uh, for a few years now. So this remarks uh, kind of marks a return. Uh, to celebrating the Gelber Prize in person. Carter won the prize um, earlier this year, but we've had the opportunity now to bring him up to the school and to have him in conversation with uh, the jury chair, Janice Stein. So that's notable about this, but the second thing that to me is, is more notable is that I get the pleasure of introducing Judith Gelber, uh, who's a great friend of the school and the chair of the, uh, of the Gelber uh, uh, Prize, um, and uh, is gonna say a few words about this prize and about our jury chair and about just how, Im and about Lionel Gelber and how important it is that, uh, uh, that the Monk School is able to have this wonderful prize to encourage and to really recognize the most important books in international affairs every year. Um, and she'll also introduce the person who's written the most important book in international affairs this year, Carter Malkasian. So uh, please give me a, uh, join me in giving a very, very warm round of applause to Judith Gelber. is working okay? Yes. And, okay, yes. great. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, thanks, Peter. And I'm going to touch on a couple of themes that, um, that Peter started, uh, talked about just now. But first, I want to thank Peter, and I actually want to welcome him in his new role as director of the Monk School. I know it's almost a year, but not quite a year. And um, I've already seen a fair amount of action with Peter over the past year, and there's no doubt that the... Um, University has made a terrific appointment, and we look forward to working with you for years and years to come. Um, having said that, um, I also would like to welcome Carter. It's a pleasure to have you, and Janice. And I'm going to, um, it's just great to have Carter here, because as Peter just said, we haven't been able to have the prize giving here now for several years, and so by Carter coming up, it gives us a terrific opportunity to fet you and <laughs> to actually hear you in person. Um, so welcome, and Janice, I am going to say some great remarks about you, but I'm going to cover a couple of other things first. Um, so having said that, um, to everyone this year, here, that's here this evening, um, if you missed the Lionel Gelber Prize conversation with Carter, and Jan Janine Giovanni in early May, and this was done in conjunction with Foreign Policy Magazine, um, I know that you're gonna want to see it. Uh, to me, it represents how a live online conversation can actually immediately engage the viewing audience. Um, also, yesterday, I listened again uh, to the lively podcast conversation between Carter and Janice, and, um, and it was a really, really worthwhile 40 minutes. And you can just access this from the uh, Gelber Prize uh, website at the Monk School. Um, and what it focused it on was not just the winning book, The American War in Afghanistan, um, but also um, on how uh, Carter's leaning, learnings can be applied to Ukraine and generally to national foreign affairs and security policy. And I think that's what's terrific about it um, from what you can take from, uh, from that 40 minutes. 
So as I mentioned, Janice will be introducing, Peter said I would be, Janice will be introducing Carter more fully, um, and I'm sure with great substance and flair. Uh, so tonight what I would like to do is take a few minutes to speak about Janice and the prize. So my uncle Lionel Gelber was a graduate of the University of Toronto and Oxford University. Uh, he was a Rhodes Scholar. He devoted his life to writing on global issues and his prize is his great legacy. The Lionel Gelber Prize was established to recognize the book deemed best of the year, published in English on international relations. Now Janice Grossstein, as you all know, was the founding director of the Monk School. And in 2000, in her first year in this role, we, the Lionel Gelber Prize Board, approached her with an offer which we hoped she wouldn't refuse. The Gelber Prize had been extant for 10 years. It had grown in size and public recognition. But what the prize now really needed was to become better administered, have broader reach, and generally be more widely recognized around the world. We needed that heft that Janice and the University of Toronto and the Monk School had. Janice, never being one to stand down from a challenge, immediately said yes, pleased as punch to have secured the only major international affairs book prize at the time. Over the next 20 years, Janice, first as head of the Monk School, ran the prize with distinguished oversight and polished management. And then, once she, quote, retired from that particular role, a word that is not part of Janice's vocabulary, she became its jury chair. During the 20 year period, many, many eminent writers, journalists, academics, historians, politicians, and world leaders had their books shortlisted for the prize. But let us not forget that a prize is only as good as its jurors. And the legions of fantastic jurors whom Janice gathered over the years tots up to a who's who of the international affairs community from Canada, the US, the UK, Europe, India, Asia, Australia, Africa, maybe not Antarctica. Janice knows everyone and everyone responds to her calls. More so, she never lets them go. Ann Applebaum won the prize, sat on the jury. Doug Saunders, who's with us tonight, shortlisted for the prize, sat on the jury. Lawrence Friedman won the prize, sat on the jury. Paul Caderio, juror from the World Bank 17 years ago, is still with us here tonight. So you get the drift. So to you, Carter, I would say watch out. <laughs> there will no doubt soon be an invitation in your mail. <laughs> all to say, we owe Janice a huge amount of thanks for all her energy, devotion, enthusiasm, and strong leadership. Now, we're not yet quite saying goodbye to Janice, but we have come through two plus years of COVID uh, and shutdowns. Uh, and frankly, we are finally back together, and I really wanted to take this opportunity on behalf of the members of the Gelber family, Patty Rubin, Sarah Charney, Noah Rubin, Nance Gelber, and myself, and the Lionel Gelber Prize Board, to say thank you, Janice, with deep affection and admiration. <laughs> now, over to you two. <laughs> thank you very, very much, Judith, for those wonderful, warm, generous words. Um, I think everybody in this room will understand, who loves books, uh, will understand it is not work. <laughs> uh, it, uh, Saunders is nodding his head. This is not what we would call work. This is just pure pleasure when every year you get to read uh, great books uh, written by so many talented people. And then you have the pleasure of an hour long conversation in which we argue um, about which is the greatest book. <laughs> Just imagine the fun of that. And Carter, uh, we chose yours. <laughs> and we had a wonderful time arguing about it. Um, I could read Carter's long introduction 
Uh, but I won't do that. I will just tell you that he is the Defense Analysis Department Chair at the Naval Postgraduate School in a wonderful part of the country, actually, <laughs> in Monterey, California. If you haven't been there, it's actually a wonderful, wonderful place uh, for a Naval College. But Carter has spent his life uh, with one foot in, two, a foot in each world, right? A foot in the academic world and the other foot um, in the policy world with occasional spurts into operations. And it's that background that made this book such a gripping read for the jurors uh, last year. Um, and since we're in person, rather than um, in a more formal YouTube setting, I'm gonna try to ask you some more personal questions about the book, Carter, uh, because we are, in a sense, in a more informal and relaxed setting. First of all, tell us, what drove you to write this book? You know, writers are obsessives, by definition. Anybody who's ever written a book, and this is a, a major book that will, I think, stand um, as the book on US policy in Afghanistan. We all thought that on the jury. What, what made you write this book? Thank you, Janice, I appreciate that, and I, I appreciate the, um, the, the, the very warm introduction. Um, as well. Um, if I could start by, you know, just saying two quick points. One is that I think it's a, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm honored to be here. And I'm particularly honored to be here on this day being 10 November. Um, and tomorrow, of course, being 11 November. Um, and so I, I went to Oxford. Um, and so I spent uh, three years and a few months in, in, in Britain. And coming from growing up in California, and I was you know, very impressed with the degree to which British, Canadians, Australians, and most of Europe pays attention to the end of the First World War and everything that happened in the second, and the memorials of all, all the losses there. Um, so being here today and being here with, I, I'm assuming, pr um, predominantly ca Canadians, um, on the day when we try to remember Vimy Ridge and Eras and Passchendaele and, and all of that, um, I, th I find it meaningful at this point. It's like closing part of a circle. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to say is like the, the, the Gilbert Prize itself um, is not just an honor, it creates opportunity for people like me. Um, so like you said, I've had foots in both worlds. And so if I would pursue a purely academic career, not that I necessarily could have, but if I had gone in that direction, my research would have probably been in a different direction. It probably would have done other things. If I had simply pursued policy things and tried to write a book on it, it would have been a much more policy-related book. But I kind of went my own way on things. And the fact that there's prizes, there's only a few prizes like the Gilbert Award, and the fact that that exists to help people like me do things, it, I think it's not just it's rewarding the, those who have written it, it's creating academic production. It's creating a line of discourse that might not otherwise exist. And as a half academic, I put tremendous value in that. <laughs> um, so now, what obsessed you that you wrote this book, Carter? <laughs> I speak for every writer in this room. Right? Uh, so I wanted to. I, I'd been in Afghanistan for about. I, I had first started working in Afghanistan in 2007. I was there again in 2013. I'd already written one book on the war, and it felt like I was there as we were talking about leaving. And so this is 2013. And I thought that I was gonna I was gonna be here for a year and a half or so, and I thought in the course of this time it'll probably end. And so perhaps I could write something that, you know, brings it together and talks about the end of the war. Of course it didn't end in one year or a year after that. It went on and on and on. Um, and the book then kind of went on and on and on. And and I was thinking that if I could write something that captures the entire conflict, that tries to cover both sides that covers conversations that were had in Afghan, in, with, with Afghans in Pashto, not in Dari, my Dari's incredibly bad, um, but then also had some sources, uh, had lots of primary sources attached to it, could look at both sides of the conflict, that would provide something substantial for people to look at. And of course, there's a criticism if you go down that course, 
One of the criticisms is you're too close. You don't have objectivity. You don't see things um, well enough. You have to be 10 years, decades later before you can really understand what happened and what the reasons are that various events occurred. And we can see the value of that approach. The histories of Vietnam that are coming out right now, the histories of the Cold War, they're showing us things we didn't know at the time. And I have no doubt with Afghanistan, we are gonna learn some things that we didn't expect to happen. We're gonna learn more about what was really going on in the Taliban. And there's people probably who we didn't even know their names right now, or only a few of us have an idea of who they were. We're gonna find out they played a much greater role than we thought. We're gonna find out more about what Pakistan's role was. Now, we may find out less about Pakistan's role in Afghanistan than we're gonna learn about, than we've learned about North Vietnam's role in Vietnam because the Taliban probably kept far fewer records and the Pakistanis are probably hiding them and not gonna to wanna to reveal them. But we're gonna learn more in that regard. But then on the other hand, if you wait 10 years, you lose feeling. You lose memory of what happened. And I'm struck by what journalist Rajiv Chandra Sakharan told me at one point. He said, if you don't write immediately, you'll lose the feeling. You'll lose the granularity. You'll lose the emotion. And other people won't then get a sense to hear that emotion or hear those details or hear that senses of what happened. Some of that is you saw the general glance this way or that way in a meeting, and you know what was really important in the meeting wasn't said. It was all in that glance of what must have happened in some room somewhere else. Or it could be the memory that you have talking to someone at a, at a certain time, seeing what was happening somewhere, and you won't be able to convey in the same way as time goes on. So objectivity and distance is incredibly valuable, but we might lose something in that. We might lose some of the emotion that other people should read as time goes on. And maybe they'll say, well, look, they made the wrong judgment because of emotion. But at least you'll be able to say that. It's really interesting because um, Carter, speaking Pashto, speaking the language of the Afghans, um, there were so few um, in the United States at the beginning, as you know, who had that capacity. There was not one in Canada when Canada made its decision to send forces to Afghanistan, and not one for the first four years. Now, that alone to me, <laughs> when you write the history, that stood out that you were able to have those local conversations and understand that. The jury said what was stunning about this book was the capacity to understand from on top and understand from underneath and to try to join those two threads. What difference did it make to you that you were in writing the book and thinking about US policy, that you were able to meet and talk to Afghans on the ground that you met with? Well, I mean, I, I, found, it, I, mean, I, I found it invaluable. And I found the language skill invaluable. And anyone who's going out to serve in some part of the world I strongly advise you to, to learn the language of that area because it's going to help you, well, it's gonna help you get information. It's gonna help you build trust. Even if you don't know the language well, just knowing some phrases can enable you to get a lot more information. When my Pashtu was very bad, I could still jump out of a Humvee and ask someone, uh, what village is this? Or where are you from? Where does your father work? Um, just very basic questions. And that, when you're asking a lot of those questions, can illuminate a whole lot about the area. And you can do it immediately. You don't have to rely on an interpreter. You don't have to ask for someone to come over to you. You can just get it done. Then over time, you can build trust through it. Because when you're talking to someone in their language and they don't have to have other people in the room, they're gonna be more likely to want to um, not divulge secrets, but share things that matter to them. Share things that are really important to their future. So I've been, the story that I remember most is I had developed a relationship with one Afghan over a long period of time. And there were some concerns about corruption in his organization. And so we, I knew I had to address this and deal with it, and the rest of the Americans weren't kind of sure how they wanted to do it. So we were driving back in his pickup one day from something we were doing out in the villages, and we came back. And so I started to talk to him about the corruption issue. I asked him what was going on. Why are, like, I, I, I just said, look, I know, I know something's happening, so just tell me what's going on. 
And he told me. Now, I don't know if he told me everything, but he told me, yes, he was kicking up money. He said he was kicking up money because he had to kick up money. He said, I didn't understand how bad it was and how there really wasn't a choice in, the, in, the, in these kind of matters. And then I asked him ways that we could reduce it, not make it so bad, uh, and try to cut off the worst parts of it. And, but just the fact he told me, I know that never could have happened if, I'd, if my posture wasn't good enough to get into a truck with him and talk, talk to him about it. And I think that um, if it's a far better use of your time when in these, in these kind of environments to spend two hours a day trying to learn the language in the morning rather than reading a report, rather than reading something on, on intelligence, and you know maybe not quite as important, I mean maybe equal to reading the New York Times, uh, but perhaps you don't need to read all of the New York Times um, to, to make that work properly. Carter, you said in two, you were in, in Afghanistan in 2013, and people were talking about leaving. <laughs> <laughs> there is a bigger story here, right? Um, and you thought they would while you were there, but that didn't happen for nine years. So why? <laughs> why, why, do we ha why do we have from a policy perspective now a discussion that starts about leaving, and clearly when you start to think and talk actively about leaving when you're inside government, you've already made a decision that um, staying longer may in fact make a situation worse, but it clearly will not make it better. Right. And that was clear in 2013, but it took nine years. So put your policy hat on now and your academic hat. Why? <laughs> so I think the most important reason that, it, that we don't leave from 2013 until 2021 is that the threat of terrorism hadn't quite disappeared yet. So 2013, Osama bin Laden had been killed, Al-Qaeda looked to be quiet on the ropes, and the Islamic State hadn't, hadn't returned yet. So as there were discussions in Washington about how many troops are going to be left after 2014, 2014 was the date President Obama had given in 2011 for the end of the US combat mission. But what that meant was unclear. What does end of combat mission mean? Does that mean we're just advising, or does that mean there's not gonna be any troops at all? in Afghanistan. So there's policy debates going on in 2013 and 2014. Now the end of that policy debate is actually in May of 2014 that President Obama decides we're going to withdraw all troops at the end of 2016. We'll leave some after 2014, uh, 5,500 to 10,000, I won't go through the exact details, and then all of them leaving at the end of 2016. So but then what happens in 2014? June 2014, the Islamic State takes Mosul. Yes, in an entirely different country. Um, but threatens Baghdad as well. And there's various terrorist threats that occur in Europe and that occur inside of the United States. Public policy, public opinion changes over that time. President Obama himself has to worry about, well, if there are major attacks in the US, what does that do for future election chances for the Democratic Party? What does that do for my ability to get done with the rest of my policy? What does that do to concerns about xenophobia inside the United States at a time when a uh, very disruptive candidate from another party is running and might take advantage of it? So President Obama's trying to manage the big picture. So when these shifts happen, and then things in Afghanistan get much, much worse in 2015, then President Obama makes the decision, no, we will stay for longer. And, he, and then so 2015, 2016, we're still staying, and that puts on the Trump administration when they arrive the decision whether or not they will stay or not. And when the Trump administration too decides initially they won't go, President Trump does want to leave, but he prevaricates between I really, really want to leave or no, I don't want there to be any terrorist threats against the United States. So in the end, he too doesn't get out entirely. So it's that, it's that threat of terrorism, it's a, it's a threat of terrorism that keeps us there, plus there's a domestic political concern here about what happens if you leave and then there's an attack on the United States. So in the act of leaving itself, there isn't much political repercussion. The act of leaving itself is a, is a fairly simple decision to make 
now the departure from Kabul raises some questions to that. But the immediate decision to leave, there aren't a lot of political repercussions. The question, though, is, okay, what happens if there is an attack, if there isn't a threat to the United States? Then what's the, the domestic political fallout for that? Now, over time, the threat of terrorism again diminishes. The Islamic State diminishes as a threat, and there's new issues that rise up for the United States, China, Russia, and then there's issues that, that, that rise up. If those two, we, we might not say those rise up for the world, certainly other issues like COVID, climate change, rise up for the world. So whereas the, two, the 2001 epic is terrorism, we are entering a new epic now that I, I, I'm willing to take a guess, this isn't a very good thing for a historian to do, um, that that terrorism period may be ending and we're facing a period of new threats. And as that international system shifts, then our willingness to stay in Afghanistan shifts. Now, if I could say one last thing about this, um, there's also a question too, it's not quite, the story isn't complete if you don't also think a little bit about, okay, what was the role of the US military and maybe our, the, the roles of our partnered and allied militaries in this, in not leaving and staying for longer? Many of the general officers were concerned about leaving and felt leaving would be um, damaging the US interest. And they would see that for different reasons. Some would say, pure, purely looking at what President Obama or President Trump had stated as goals to counter terrorism, they would purely say, leaving will create a greater terrorist threat on the basis of all the information we have available right now. Other generals felt they wanted a bit more. They wanted to win. They wanted to succeed. Or maybe they didn't want to win. They didn't want to lose. They didn't want to have the humiliation of leaving, the humiliation of being told they were defeated. They don't want the humiliation of another Vietnam. And so the role this plays in the decision making is that for any of the presidents, and this comes up a lot with Obama, it's true, true for Trump and it's even true for Biden, is if they decide to leave, and leaving was something they decided that was against the advice of the military, then there's a political cost to be paid because if anything happens, crit critics will say, you left, there was a terrorist attack, and the military told you to do otherwise. So the fact that the, even, even though the military never actually does that, never says don't leave, the fact that they're concerned, the fact that they're worried may have been affecting some of the presidents, presidents in plural, decision making there, making perhaps them less willing to leave. Okay, but the last point here, though, that is really important, that ties it back together, is the generals wouldn't have a leg to stand on if it wasn't for terrorism. If it wasn't for the concern of terrorism, them saying that they wanted to stay for longer, they're a concern, it, it, I, I, I think it would have been completely irrelevant. It's only the fact that there was this other threat there that allowed things to play in that way. So I'm Sorry. gonna put you on the spot now, yeah. Carter. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I'm just gonna compare the Canadian experience, the U.S. experience, really quickly, but we had a prime minister come to office, Prime Minister Harper, yeah. enthusiastic, all in, starts to get advice from generals, goes out into the field, takes a hard look, said, this is not winnable, and came home and opposed the military and unilaterally, within one year, said, we're out. And that was not a happy move in Washington, let me tell you. No, I remember. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when you look back, was that the right decision to stay, given there was a threat of terrorism, given the military wanted to win or didn't want to lose? And that's very common. Was that, in your view now, looking back, was that the right decision, or should the United States have left by 2050? I tend to look at that period of time that the leaders, they didn't have as much choice as sometimes people, as they didn't have as much choice. And that doesn't mean Canada didn't have choice, but in the United States, the, there was a great deal of limitation on what kind of decisions a leader could make at that point. Why? I'd say it's, be, it's partly the domestic political implications. It's partly gonna be the concern of terrorism, the concern of a terrorist attack on the United States, um, that uh, the United States being a, the, the level of tar that the United States would be. So I see Doug and Peter nodding your heads in sympathy with what you're saying. Um, but, but let me just say that gives a veto. That gives a veto 
to a part of public opinion that you might argue is excessively alarmist. It could give a veto to a part of a, so part of the danger, part of the context of this is the fear that came out of, the fear that came out of 9-11. Yeah. And is some of the feelings for revenge. Yeah. And the fear of there could be an, a WMD attack. Yeah. Um, these kind of concerns were raised there. And I think they're a great cautionary tale of Afghanistan. To, to not let those things drive us. I mean, I'm not sure if we can't not let them drive us, but to be aware of how they drove us, to be aware of how we inflated this particular goal at that time to a level in retrospect that doesn't appear to commence to be commensurate for what that actual threat was. But as a historian, I have a hard time going back and saying, well, they could just pull the plug here or pull the plug there because yeah. they seem too worried about it, too concerned about it. Yeah. And the thing that, that is kind of most important is in the course of the war, there are very few times when people said, let's get out, when that was like a debate to let's, to let's really leave. Now, it is more apparent from 2013, and especially like 2018, 19 onward. But when the decision makers aren't mentioning it in conversations with each other, then that raises questions about, okay, how viable of a choice would this have been? So we have two colleagues who have cards for you to write questions for Carter on. If you just write them down, they'll bring them up to me, and I will try to ask as many as I can. While you're doing that, let's take these lessons and think now about the war in Ukraine. Absolutely. Right? Um, there, is, there is a heated debate, and we may, in fact, be in a world, depending on what happens um, in the Senate elections, when they are finally, when the final runoffs are in here, where there will be discussion about how does this war end. Not dissimilar from the discussion you had in your book. Um, and what's the strategy to end the war? What, did, what would you say to decision makers who might have that discussion in six months, in a year? What lessons from Afghanistan would you say, would you share with decision makers if they asked you? Well, the first, I would say what I said a moment ago to you about about interests and realizing that at the beginning of the conflict, which you view as a threat in retrospect may not look to be that dangerous. So I'd caution to remember that on Ukraine now, that the degree to which Ukraine appears to be a, a great danger now may not look that way later on. When the shock of the Russian invasion has decreased a little bit and as time has gone on and we're questioning about costs, questioning about you know how much how much is it costing us to send munitions? How much is that costing our military to do that? How much is it costing the industrial base to do that? Then we may look at it a different way. I think perhaps equally important is something else I would say, is that one of the great early lessons of Afghanistan was that we thought we were doing way better than we were. Mm -hmm. We, after we toppled the Taliban, we were horribly overconfident. We neglected the fact that the Taliban still had strength. We neglected the fact that they could come back. We neglected to build a, an Afghan military that was strong enough. We neglected to bring the Taliban into negotiations effectively. So I don't think that it, it, all these things aren't gonna fit the same way to, to Ukraine. However, as we look at Russia now, we should be cognizant that they may not be as weak as we think them to be. And in particularly certain circumstances, they may not be as weak as we think them to be. Um, the Ukrainian armed forces may not be as good as we think them to be. Our tactics and our systems may not be as good as we think them to be. Um, now, that's not to say we should overstate the adversary or exaggerate the threat too much, but also not to be lured down the wrong path um, in the euphoria of, of victory, or in this case, tactical successes. One more thread. Um, you rightly wrote in the book about how important the fear of a terrorist attack was, and even you, you talked about the possibility that there could be a weapon of mass destruction that could leak in yeah. practice. Yeah. To, 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 it was, there was a lot of discussion in Washington yes. during this period about that. Um, let's move to Ukraine now, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> where there is a slightly different discussion about the use of tactical nuclear weapons and the criticism that the fear of that and the restraint that President Biden has shown is in fact self-deterrence. 
It is restraining, it is uh, hamstringing the Ukrainian forces by refusing to supply the kinds of weapons that are necessary. Um, how do you evaluate that argument, Carter? I evaluate that um, President Biden has, a, has, a, has to walk a very careful line here. So while we've been talking about Afghanistan here, um, back in the Naval Postgraduate School, I'm actually teaching a course on deterrence right now that thanks to my uh, political science, I've double majored political science and history, thanks to that I have a whole bunch of background in deterrence from Berkeley. Um, so if you look at the writings of Thomas Schelling, if you look at more recent writings by people such as Jim Fearon or uh, Robert Powell using game theoretical methods, what you see is really important here when you're deterring, when you're deterring someone or you're getting into a conflict with another nuclear power is the stakes or who cares more about what is at stake. And the side that cares more is willing to go further, willing to step closer to the brink, willing to take more risk. So I think President Biden has to be very cognizant of how much Russia may value Ukraine versus how much the United States may value Ukraine. Thank you. Knowing that President Putin may be willing to do things that are highly dangerous, ill-advised, because he believes that Ukraine is so important um, to him. And so I think that's what he's trying to do, is he's trying to prevent that escalation while at the same time preventing aggression. And that probably leads down to like, what's the, what's the most likely result of this conflict? It's probably likely to be a frozen conflict. Now, I wanna be careful saying probably, because one of the most dangerous things one can do is try to predict the way something can go. One of the other lessons of Afghanistan is to not think that you know the direction history is gonna take you. So in Afghanistan, first they thought the Taliban were defeated. Okay, that didn't work. Later on, they thought the surge and counterinsurgency methods would work. And they didn't consider other options that might have been better at that time. On a little bit later on, we talked about withdrawing and trying to, get, trying to withdraw, but we may have focused a little bit too much on, well, we're gonna be able to withdraw and we'll do it, versus, well, we may have to stay a bit longer. And then, of course, you can see during our evacuation of last year that perhaps people were a little bit too close to the possibility that Afghanistan could fall really, really quickly. So as we think about Ukraine right now, we don't want to think that we can see the direction that things can absolutely go. We want to instead think about what are the different possible ways. Russian decisive victory, Russia, Russia getting um, beaten back, frozen conflict, peace settlement, think about different ways these could happen and make sure our policy is in a place right now where we can adjust appropriately to any of those happening. Now, the one I think, I tend to think out of those four that I would think is maybe a little bit more likely than the others is a frozen conflict because it's hard for us to escalate. It looks like Russia's having difficulty providing enough military force for them to succeed effectively. It looks like Ukraine's gonna have trouble um, taking everything back. So that would lean me towards a frozen conflict. But I don't want to say that's the way it's going to go because I think that's, that's poor strategy to do it that way. You should be looking at different options, different ways things can go. How do you appropriately mitigate and create insurance for those different kinds of possibilities? So, Craig, we have a, a question from an Afghan colleague and a really interesting one uh, from Mustafa. How do you evaluate the role that Zon, the amb that Ambassador Zolni Carter played um, in mediating? Would it have been different if he had not been part of the process? Would, would there have been the possibility of reaching an, an agreement for an orderly transfer of power? Was this, was this in fact, failed leadership? So, um, ha having met Ambassador Kulazad, and, and, and you've probably met him at various times yes. too, um, and he is in, he is an inspired diplomat. He has unrivaled energy, unrivaled ability to be able to talk to people, see opportunities, and move forward, uh, move, move forward against them. Um, and so I, th I think one has to immediately recognize that about Ambassador Khalil Azad. And so I'm not, I'm not sure that that someone else could have created more opportunities than, than he did in this. But this is also a very difficult task. 
and that difficult task was always going to be complicated. And the longer you do something, the harder it becomes, the more resistance that is faced. And the more you try to attain something great, the more enemies you will acquire. The more enemies you will acquire, then the more difficulties you yourself will face. Um, so I guess it may not be entirely answering it. Um, he, I really think he wanted peace. I really think he wanted to make that happen. So like, I didn't meet Mullah Baradar many times. Um, Ambassador Kurils, I've met Mullah Baradar many, many times uh, and, and saw, saw him in, in private groups and different kind of groups. So he had a very good relation with Mullah Baradar. Mullah Baradar, I don't know if you've met him, but he, he, has, the, he has the way, not Just so much. Just tell of, everybody who Mullah Baradar oh, is. Oh, Mullah Baradar was the lead of the Taliban delegation. Mullah Baradar had been a, a, not quite a founding member of the Taliban, but there from early on. He had been the, effectively the CEO for the Taliban under Mullah Omar for several years. Uh, the Pakistanis had put him in jail for several years, and then he'd been let out. And then at that point, he helped run t uh, Taliban political affairs, and he ran the delegation inside of, uh, in, 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 at, at Doha. And so unlike a lot of the other Taliban leaders who are religious leaders, and who could be more firm and doctrinaire about things and, and, and harder to talk to as well. Mullah Baradar is like a tribal Khan from Urizgan. He's quiet, he's withheld, he looks at you like he cares about you. He seems to, he's always trying to create some degree of compromise to bring things forward. And so when he would say that he believed if we could get to an agreement, if the United States and Taliban could get to an agreement, that then there would definitely be a peace agreement between the rest of the Afghans. And when he was dismissive of other folks, when they would say, well, the other Taliban, when they'd say, well, the, you know, the, we can't work with the government, we can't do this, he would be more open to those, to those possibilities. So as Master Khalil's I was talking to Barada, I can see how he thought it's worthwhile to go forward with peace, and it's worthwhile to make something happen. Now, in the end, it didn't work out. Um, and I, I mean, I'm not sure you know, who's entirely at blame for all, of, for all of that, but there's probably two possibilities as to why it didn't work out. Or, well, there's many possibilities, let me just name two here. One possibility is that the Taliban never wanted to agree to anything. They never had any intention of doing it, and we were being played the whole time. Another possibility is that they were willing to cooperate. And at the time we had those discussions with them, they would have had actually, if things had gone forward, they would have had a real agreement with the, with the Afghan government. But what stopped that from happening is we started withdrawing troops fast. We didn't hold the conditions. We let things go quickly. So the Taliban saw possibilities on the battlefield that they couldn't get on the negotiating table. And as those possibilities went forward, they took them. Um, so just different ways of interpreting it. a pretty it. convincing argument, uh, <laughs> I think, actually. Uh, this, this next question goes back in history and goes forward in history. Uh, it also comes um, from an Afghan colleague. And the question is, right at, and you read about this in the book, right at the beginning, was there a huge missed opportunity when the United States did not bring the Taliban in to the government um, during and immediately after the Bonn conference. Was this the moment um, when the history of Afghanistan might have taken a different path? So yes, that's a huge, it, it, it is a huge missed opportunity um, because we, instead of bringing in the defeated side to have, a, to have a say in what was going to happen, to create a political agreement, instead we shut them out. Okay, so what we don't know is would that, if we had done that, would there have been no war? Would there have been victory essentially for the government? Would there have been peace? We don't know that. But it's a reasonable guess that at least a few Taliban would have been less likely to fight. That they would have been less willing to go forward and do things. And that could have meant a war that was either less intense or more delayed fewer U.S. casualties, fewer Afghan casualties, fewer commitment on our, on our side. So in that sense, it's a huge missed opportunity, and there aren't later on in the war too many other opportunities. I'm not sure there are any opportunities later on in the war of that, of that size. Um, and so, and then beyond that, 
for us not to have considered that possibility, for us to have had brushed it aside, that is also a significant error. So even if you see the war as, I, I tend to see the war as fairly tragic without a lot of opportunities to take another, uh, another direction. Even if that falls within those boundaries, that still doesn't absolve us of blame for not trying at that point. Yeah. You make a really passionate argument in the book about how leading out um, at least a third, <laughs> if not more, uh, of the representatives of the Afghan population at that time uh, built in a level of conflict. One last question from an Afghan colleague, and I'm actually privileging questions when I know they come um, from uh, people who have come to Canada uh, from Afghanistan and are now fellow Afghan Canadians. Let me put Absolutely. it to you that way. Um, this question um, is also an interesting what does the shambolic retreat, <laughs> I love that word. Which, which one? <laughs> the, the shambolic U.S. retreat from Kabul. Uh, how much of that do you think played in Putin's mind when he decided to invade Ukraine? I don't know, but it's a natural thing one starts to, 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 to wonder. Um, that did he think that the United States wanted to get out of Afghanistan, didn't fight there, and therefore they won't fight in Ukraine. Um, and so, you know, there's a, there's a very good passage in Schelling to, to go back there on arms and influence. It says one of the things a country needs to protect most is its, you know, face and reputation. It says face and reputation is often disregarded as not important. And he essentially says that's nonsense. This is one of the most valuable things a country can have. Now, but that said, um, Perhaps he underestimated us then, but maybe he's not underestimating us now. So I think the trick is to, a country can't fight over everything that is of low interest to it. Allies can't fight over everything that's of low interest to them. You have to choose where you're gonna fight and make it clear that that is actually where you're going to fight. So the most important thing after Afghanistan is that we are clear in those matters about what we see to be truly of our interest and that we are going to stick to it and then make the right signals that, that that's what's gonna happen. This is the last question. Peter, how much time do we have? Okay, great. Because this one also is identified as somebody um, from Afghanistan. And the question is really how, and Canadians ask this too, but we did it too, by the way, for the record. How could U.S. intelligence have gotten it so wrong in 2021? after being on the ground for so long. How could that mistake have happened when they underestimated how quickly the government would fall once the Taliban had taken control of the northern provinces? Now, to be fair to us, to we Canadians, we consume U.S. intelligence. To an unfortunate degree, we gorge ourselves on it, and it's actually not helpful <laughs> that we won't do our own cooking at all. But um, how could this happen? And that's, a, I think, a very valid question. So um, I'd take it to be a, that's a problem in strategy and judgment more than it is of intelligence. Uh, so I haven't read the exact intelligence reports that went to the NSC or went to the president regarding how fast Kabul might fall. Mm -hmm. But I know a great number of experts and scholars, and that was not considered out of the range of possibility. And so some people may have said, like I would have said, well, if it's it, you know, so, uh, spontaneous collapse, that is a possibility. I wouldn't have put it in August. I would have said it's a, it'd be a little bit later, and that would be most likely. But people weren't going to throw it out as a possibility. And if you're going to say that, well, it's more likely in September than August, well, what's really the difference of that anyways? Um, and so the, the job of a decision maker, the job of a strategist, the job of a policymaker is not to expect the future is going to be predicted for you by an intelligence analyst. The job of a decision maker and a policy maker is to see the different ways that things could go and to judge accordingly on what actions need to be taken to meet those different possibilities. So blaming on intelligence to me is kind of missing, missing the point. You know, there was a chance this was going to happen and to, to some degree, we weren't ready and prepared for it. 
And I also think that President Biden was fully aware of this possibility, given what we know of his decision making prior to the April decision to leave, in which we know he was concerned about a Saigon-like evacuation. He was concerned that things were gonna fall away. And I tend to think about it more that, well, Biden was aware of some of this, and he was willing to make a hard decision. Um, so. And a follow-on question, and again, um, we've had a very difficult experience because of that disorderly withdrawal. Um, the United States left behind translators, fixers for journalists, uh, people who, and same story in Canada. Yeah, absolutely. We have people in Europe today, the lucky ones, the unlucky ones are in Pakistan, and the least lucky ones are in still struggling in safe houses in Kabul, and we have not been able um, to bring them out. Uh, what obligation, in your view, Carter, does the U.S. government and the Canadian government have to Afghans who put their lives at risk in order to help force us on the ground while they were deployed in Afghanistan? So, you know, for, I guess I, I feel obliged somewhat to, like, recognize them, it, recognize the soldiers from all countries who were there at Kabul airport and helping to get everyone out um, and, and putting themselves at, at risk to make it happen. And like, I don't know of anyone who was trying to stop um, people from getting out. And so that, that I'm always, I'm, I'm taken by a great deal. The, we should try to maintain open doors to those people who worked with us and helped us over time. We should especially care about those whose lives are at risk right now in Afghanistan and who the Taliban could want to do something against for what they did you know, for us or even for what they did for their country. If the Taliban are looking to kill someone or imprison someone, we should want to, to help those people so that they can leave. What does that mean though? Well, at this point that probably means maintaining the open doors for them to come if it's possible to negotiate with the Taliban enough to let some of these people out, that can work. So are there those kinds of negotiations with the Taliban? I don't know what's been happening over the last like three or four months, but yes, those negotiations were going on prior to that. Um, so, yeah. So the Canadian policy has actually slowed down, even for those who are outside of Afghanistan, and they've slowed down because of the rigor, I'm, using the language that is official, you'll read between the lines here, because of the requirements of extensive vetting for security purposes, which has stranded large numbers because of the off chance that there are one or two um, who would be of concern. Yeah. Um, how do you respond to that? <laughs> Those Afghans who need to come and who are in danger, the first and easiest response is there should be some Canadian or some American who dealt with this Afghan. And if those Can that Canadian or that American who dealt with the Afghan can you know, simply vouch for them or say that they don't see that kind of threat here, then we should be willing to take that risk. Right. Now, some of those Afghans may not have that. that they may not have that there. there and so that makes it more difficulty for, that, for them to come in. I'm not, so I've seen this in the United States as well, and yes. I'm not surprised at all that this has reemerged. I'm not, at the time, a year ago, or over a year ago now, when we wanted to get people out, it was visceral, when people, they felt we absolutely had to pull people out, then the strength of the people doing background checks and the security concerns and the counterterrorism and counterintelligence concerns, they were on their back foot then. They couldn't do as much, but now, as the concerns of other people have decreased, that reasserts itself. Um, and if it's possible, I don't think it's possible legislatively, but it was possible legislatively to reduce some of these demands, then that would also be helpful in getting people through. There's a, there's a lot, very big story here. <laughs> but it's scarier than that too. It's scarier because, like we talk, our, our distance from Afghanistan, I worry will increase because as Afghanistan becomes more, it's run by the Taliban government. The Taliban government, perhaps it'll fall soon, but there's an equally good chance that it won't fall soon. So it's gonna stay in position there. And as it stays in position there, any Afghan in Afghanistan will start to be viewed more 
as a member of a country that has ill intent toward the United States. And that will make it more difficult for people to come here. It will make it difficult for Americans, or perhaps less Canadians, but certainly difficult for Americans to go to Afghanistan. And so that distance will increase. It will make it more difficult for people who are in danger to, in danger to come. And that kind of relationship that we've been used to, where Afghanistan's can come back and forth, we can go back and forth, that won't be there anymore. Will diminish. Yeah, will diminish. So there's an urgency then um, about, um, you know, I, I know that we now expect documents from people who have crossed the border uh, with almost nothing and yet, um, to deal with some of these concerns, we require documents. Yeah. Well, that's an impossible demand to meet. For a many. passport is very hard to get now. Yeah. Yeah. That's not on the front pages of the newspapers anymore, unfortunately, but it is a real story. Um, here's one last question, again, from an academic colleague. What would victory have looked like for the United States in Afghanistan? And what will victory in Ukraine look like for the United States? It's a great question. So the realistic sticking in context of the book and everything, I don't, I don't think we should think that there was a chance for, I think we should be wary of thinking there was a chance of victory like we think of victory in World War II or even like victory in Korea. Success in Afghanistan, which is probably a better term, um, would have pretty much only have been our ability to stay there with a small number of forces over a long period of time um, with a government that was fairly stable and, and an insurgent, a Taliban insurgency continuing to go on, but that was manageable by a small number at a low cost. I think in retrospect, that's success. I don't think total victory was possible. For a while, a lot of people talked about enabling the Afghan government to stand on its own. I don't think that was, I, 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 don't, I don't think that was a realistic expectation, and I don't think we should look at it that way. This is a conflict that was going to get muddled through, and that the, the success is can you do this in a low cost, sustainable way that prevents threats to your interest? Now, some may even said you, we did that and we left. That's success. I'm not sure I'm willing, like, just personally to go that far, but I think that's how I would define success there. So success in Ukraine may be something like that, um, where there's a diminishing of the conflict. Kiev hasn't fallen, um, but some degree of fighting is probably still going on, and there won't be any kind of declared victor or loser or settlement. That's probably a reasonable goal. I want to thank Carter. Um, I want to thank you for writing the book, <laughs> for learning Pashto, <laughs> which really matters, really, really matters, for doing the research, uh, for the honesty that just shone through that book, for the fearlessness with which you looked at decision makers that you were working for and with. This is hard to do. Um, often people don't want to hear what you have to say, um, and it is not easy. And I really believe, as does Doug, who was on that jury, that this book will remain the definitive book about U.S. policy in Afghanistan. It is an extraordinary book. If you haven't read it yet, you, you have to treat yourself because it, in addition to everything else, it's beautifully written. I also want to thank the Gelber family, Judith Gelber, Patty Gelber, Sarah Charney, all the members of the Gelber family and the Gelber board. Um, again, this is a family that is committed to books, um, is committed um, to good writing. <laughs> is committed to write good writing about important subjects that people who are interested in the world can read, um, and books that deal with big issues that we all need to understand better. Uh, the Gelber Prize is over 30 years old now, uh, but it, I believe, is more relevant than ever as we move into a world 
that is more complex, more dangerous, um, more fraught, <laughs> uh, where the kind of understanding and deep knowledge that Carter brought to the subject is absolutely essential if we are going to be able to muddle through. So thank you, Carter. Thank you to the Galbraith family. And thank you for the great question.